as a child, what was your relationship like with your father? You know, why is it important uh, for children to have a loving father in the home? We'll answer those questions and more in just a moment as we study 1 John chapter 3. Hey folks, welcome to our Wednesday Bible study, the first one of the year 2020. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with us, if you would, to the book of 1 John chapter 3. And just a moment ago, I asked you a question. I asked you to think about what it was like to have a relationship with your father or what your relationship with your father was like when you were growing up. And I follow that up by asking this question, why do you believe that it is important for children in this day and age to have a loving father. Uh, do you believe that that is something that is uh, significant uh, for them? Uh, we're going to look at God's word and see what it is that uh, that, that the book of John, uh, 1 John tells us about that. We're actually going to be uh, looking at uh, passages out of uh, 1 John chapter 3, uh, beginning with verse 1. 1 John uh, chapter 3, uh, beginning with verse 1. And we'll, uh, we'll go down to, uh, actually, uh, we'll just take it and see how we go, how many verses we go with that. All right, look with me if you would. First John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him like he is. Verse 3, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is purified. Whoever commits sin and commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness, and you know that he was manifest to take away uh, our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, uh, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, but he, just as he is righteous. Uh, verse 8, he who sins uh, is, look at verse 8 again, he who sins uh, is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Verse 10, in this the children of God and the children of the devil are manif manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness uh, is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Let's pray together this morning. Uh, Father, we just uh, come to you now. We pray, Lord, that... Uh, that, that you would just open our hearts to your word. We, we thank you, Father, for uh, bringing us through uh, the year 2020. We realize that there are many challenges as we uh, head into this new year. But, Lord, may uh, our hearts and our thought be that, that uh, in this new year we want to walk closer to you. Uh, Lord, may our heart be that we want to uh, draw ourselves into your presence in such a fashion that, that we hear you louder and clearer than we ever have. Father, we pray that uh, you will take your word tonight, that you might uh, open it up uh, to our hearts, that uh, you would just pour into us. Give us uh, this, this time and these moments to pay careful attention to what the Spirit has to say to us. Lord, we also pray that you would uh, use this, your messenger, uh, that as we lift you up, you will truly speak to your children and meet every need that is in their heart at this particular point. So bless our time that we'll spend together, Father, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we started with that, uh, uh, that, that first question about did you think that, that it was important uh, for, uh, for children to have a, a good relationship with their father, to have a good walk with their father. Now, in our text, John talks about the wonderful privilege that you and I have of being a child of God. Uh, so what does that mean to you, to be a child of God? Uh, now, as a child of God, and as you think about that, you know, what kind of love does our Heavenly Father 
have for each and every one of us. Now, I want us to, uh, you don't have to turn here, but I want to go over to a passage uh, in John chapter 1 that describes the type of love uh, that God has uh, for each and every one of us. And it's in the, in the book of, uh, of uh, John chapter 1, uh, beginning verse 11. It says this, it says, uh, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of, of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Did you get that part, particularly verse 13? But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. I believe that that is one of the greatest uh, illustrations uh, that, that any one of us can have when it comes down to, uh, uh, you know, to, to our relationship with the Lord. Nothing comes closer, nothing is any better than, than describing uh, what that uh, what that walk is like that a child uh, a father a son a father a daughter how you love your children I want you to think about that just for a moment uh, when asked uh, about your children most parents would tell you that they'll do anything in this world uh, to to provide the very very best for their children uh, most would say you know I will truly I would lay down my life for my child I don't believe there is a relationship that comes any closer to explaining. Uh, what the relationship between God and, and man, those who are believers, are than, than a father and a son relationship. So I believe that that is extremely important. I think that one of the greatest things in the world uh, is, is to think about, when you, when you think about being in a position of a father, it's a father's duty to teach their children, not just uh, in how to be able to survive in the world, but to be able to teach their children in the ways of the Lord. You know, we look at we look around, and, and there are many fathers today who they look back and say, "Well, I want my son to be self sufficient. I want him to be able to um, make his way in life." And all those are good things. But folks, if you'd simply do that, if that's the the only course that you have as a father with your children, then you have failed miserably because you have failed to tell them and to teach them about the greatest thing that there is, and that is salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That is an eternal decision not just a temporal one. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't had that opportunity to do that, and don't sit back and say that it's too late. Even if you have grown children, it's still not too late. If they're living and breathing, it is not too late uh, to be that example in their life, to sit down with them and to explain that to them. Just as a father teaches a child, God the Father teaches us as his children, and we're to obey our Father. Uh, I, I mean, that is just so, so very important uh, when we look at, uh, at at these particular scriptures when it comes down to it. Now, that's what we're learning about today. And, and the Lord says he has given us those chances. He's given us that opportunity. Uh, and, and people would say, well, what must I do to become a child of God? The Word tells us that we simply need to believe in him. Being able to ask the Lord to forgive your sins and to come into your heart uh, is a great way to start that relationship. Now, you've heard me say that many, many times, whether it's uh, during our Sunday morning services or whether it's during our Bible studies. Uh, it, it's not about simply just doing a bunch of do's and not doing a bunch of don'ts that the Bible tells us about. God wants a personal relationship with you and I. He wants to walk with us. He wants to talk with us. It's not just about checking the boxes off and saying, well, this is what the Bible said and I did it. No, what we need to do is we need to do those things out of a love for our Lord. You know, he tells us a little bit more about that as, you know, as, as we get into uh, you know, the, the, the text that we're looking at. Um, but uh, what we've got is, uh, let's, let's go back to the passages that, that we see in, uh, in 1 John chapter 3. Now, uh, he starts off and he says in, in verse 1, he says, See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called uh, the children of God. Uh, that, that we are. See, the reason why the world doesn't know us is that, w it, it, is that it did not know him. Now, he goes on in verse 2 and he gets very specific. He says, Beloved, we are God's children now. Now, he is referring to those who have accepted him. He is referring to those who, who have understood that there needs to be that forgiveness of sin, that, that a person is a sinner, that they need to be saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And he is addressing those who know, uh, who know him. He says, Beloved, <clears throat> we are God's children now, and what 
it, it, look at verse 2. Uh, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. In other words, our, our goal, our, our aim, our task is to be like him. And it says that when we see him, we shall be like him, you know, pure, sinless. Verse 3 says, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Now, I'm using some of these verses out of the, the English Standard Version, which is a very good translation. In fact, it's a ver verbatim translation. But it makes some of these verses make a whole lot more sense uh, to most people than as we read them in, in the King James. Verse 4 says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness, sin, is lawlessness. Now, I want us to spend a few a little bit of time in these few verses because I believe this is very, very important in many, many aspects. So let's look at verses 4 and 5. It says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning. Think about what that means. When you hear a practice of sinning, what does that conjure up in your mind? That means somebody who willfully sins. That means somebody who, who knows what they're doing is wrong, and yet they continue to walk down that road. They continue to trek down that road of sin. So once again, verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practice lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now, verse 5 says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. Now, here's the kicker, verse 6. Verse 6 says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Now, there's a lot of people in, in, in this day and age that have a problem with this particular verse. Uh, there are those who will doubt their salvation uh, because of what this says. There are those who will question their walk. Uh, and I think that in some ways that's good. Now, I don't want you to question your salvation, but I want you to take heart to what these verses say. Now, notice what verse 6 says again. No one who abides in him, meaning the Lord, keeps on sinning. Remember what I said a moment ago out of verse 4, uh, where it sets up this precedent of, of continued willful sin? Verse 6 says, no one who abides in him, and that is the key. You know, there's a passage of scripture that's one of the greatest that it, in my life in the word where Jesus said, you know, abide in me and I in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. Now, when we think about that particular aspect, the branches cannot live without being attached to the vine. If you take a, a branch and you break it off of, of the vine, it will shrivel up and it will die. It gets its nutrients. It gets everything that it is uh, to be able to survive uh, from being attached and the Lord is wanting us to be attached to him, to abide in him. Now, notice verse 6. It says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Folks, you just can't do it. You, If, if you profess to be a born-again believer, you cannot continue with your sinful ways without the Holy Spirit convicting your heart in such a fashion that you're just miserable inside. You can't do it. Now, yeah, some people will point to that as, uh, uh, as an indicator of their salvation or not having salvation. And I believe that this really is a great indicator. I've said this many, many times and will continue to say it. A, a, when you get Jesus in your heart, Jesus changes your life. You cannot go and do the th same things that you did, but it's not one of those things uh, that, that you're sitting there saying, oh, well, I've got to give this up or I've got to give that up. Listen, when you fall in love with the Lord so much, you will want to please him. You will want to do the things that the word of God tells you. You won't want to be uh, the person along the way uh, who just w wants to keep on doing what they're doing. I, I hope and pray that now you're beginning to understand the difference between somebody who truly knows the Lord and somebody who is, is taking on a form of, of salvation by saying, well, if I do these things and I have more uh, check marks in, the, uh, the, in the, the positive side of the ledger than the negative, then I'm going to be okay. Or, or hopefully you're not one of those people who says, well, I'm a good person and God doesn't send good people to hell. Folks, that doesn't have anything to do with it. The choice, the Lord has given you and I the choice and the choice is whether to receive him or not. God doesn't send anyone to hell. Your own actions will send you there. 
So think about that for a moment. We've all been born sinners. The word says we, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 6 says, no one who abides in him attaches themselves to him, keeps on sinning, having that repetitive, perpetual sin in your life. And, and, and the person that's doing this knows about it. It's not one of those situations where you go, oh, all of a sudden I just realized I've been sinning. No, the Holy Spirit in your life will speak to you. The Holy Spirit will let you know when you're doing things that are not pleasing to God. So verse 6 again, no one who abides in him, being attached to him, keeps on sinning. No one who, uh, no one who keeps on sinning has either seen or knows him. Now, this is a good barometer. This verse is a good barometer for people to look at their lives. I know that each and every one of us have been somewhat judgmental in our lives when we may have looked at somebody and they have professed that they have given their life to Jesus, but there is actually there's zero evidence in their life of their walk with the Lord. Now, remember what I said a moment ago. Jesus in your life should change your life. Uh, this really is a good indicator. This is a good barometer. Now, the part that, that, that is depressing about that is that Satan has so many people deceived into thinking that, that having a walk with the Lord is about just doing some sort of a process or doing some sort of a program. And that's not true. Folks, God wants a relationship with you. He, you know, it, it, the Word tells us that He's a friend that, that sticks closer than a brother. He walks with us. He talks with us. That's what He wants to do. It's not about just checking off those boxes like we talked about a moment ago. And when, when you get Jesus in your life, it should change that sinning aspect of your life. You cannot be a believer and keep on doing perpetual, willful, knowing sin without there being conviction in your life of that wrongdoing. It just can't happen. So therefore, that is a good indicator as to whether or not we have a true walk with our Lord and Savior. Now look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, Little children, let no one deceive you. Remember what I said a moment ago? So many people are deceived by Satan uh, as to what salvation really is. Now I'm going to say something that may stagger some people. I believe that churches are full of lost people. Uh, I, yeah, the word tells us not all who say, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I believe that that particular verse is referring to those who have that form of godliness, who think that I can check the boxes or do these things. Uh, and, and there's a lot of really good church people that are going to be on their way to hell. Verse 7 says, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous, talking about the pattern of Jesus Christ that we should set our lives after. Notice, whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Verse 8 says, whoever makes a practice of sinning. Now we're getting back to, to talking about that perpetual sin again. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Now those aren't my words. Those are words that come straight from, from the Lord's word. It says, whoever makes a practice, a perpetual, willful act of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason uh, the, the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. We know that, that, that Jesus giving his life on Calvary's cross and picking it back up was to pay the sin debt and the sin price for each and every person that would ever be born on this earth. Now, that doesn't mean that we're perfect. And I want us to, to, you know, to understand for just a moment. That doesn't mean that when you trust Christ, that you're going to be able to live the rest of your life without sinning. But folks, there's a difference between slipping up and making something a, a repeated and perpetual act in your life. You know, when the Lord convicts your heart, when you've trusted Jesus and he convicts your heart in regard to an area of sin in your life, uh, you know, he, ex he expects us to repent. Now, that word repent is very important. Repentance means a turning around. A pastor uh, many years ago, a matter of fact, uh, almost a couple of decades ago, uh, who spoke here at the church described repentance as a whoop around. That means you're going in this direction and you're going in the wrong direction. And when God reveals that to you, then and, and you realize that repentance means a turning around, doing a 180 degree turn and heading toward righteousness. Now that doesn't mean that we won't have times where we will slip and fall or where we will slip and fail. 
But we cannot continue to sit back and say, well, I know that this act is sin, but I'm going to keep on doing it anyway. It doesn't mean that we're going to take advantage and beat up the grace of God. It doesn't mean that you can go out and sin and say, well, it's all right for me to sin because I can just go ask God for forgiveness and then go right back out and do it again. No, that's not repentance. Yeah, I believe where there is repentance, there is forgiveness because that's what the Word of God tells us. It says, whoever, verse 8, makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Straightforward. For the devil has been sinning since the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy uh, the works of the devil. Verse 9 says, no one born of God, being a, being a believer, makes a practice of sinning. We just can't do it. Because you're, you're, the, the Holy Spirit's conviction in your heart will not allow that. There is great evidence for the Lord in your heart when there is conviction in your heart over sin that you are committing. You cannot just keep on going down that road uh, as a believer. Verse 9, but uh, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him. When you trusted Jesus, you, you received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. The Holy Spirit is your guide. The Holy Spirit is your comfort. The Holy Spirit is also your correction. He will let you know when you are doing things that are outside of the will of God. So each and every one of us have a personal teacher when we accepted Christ. The Holy Spirit uh, gives us the leadership that we need. Some people say, well, you know what? I didn't grow up in church like you did. I, you know, I haven't read the Bible through many times like you have. How am I supposed to know this? Right there's your answer, folks. When you trust Jesus, the Holy Spirit, who, you know, who is the Word, the Holy Spirit who knows it front and back, the Holy Spirit uh, who knows every uh, little secret in our life, uh, teaches us, leads us, and guides us. And man, that, that should be a comfort to each and every one of us. No one born of God, verse 9, makes a practice of sinning um, for God, uh, for God himself. Uh, verse 9, no, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed, that the Holy Spirit abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Verse 10 says, by this it is, it is, it is evident who are children of God. Now, he is saying in this particular verse, you can tell who the children of God are. Let's look carefully at verse 10. By this, it is evident who are children of God and who are children of the devil. You can look at them and see. Those who follow the path of righteousness according to the word of God. Now, people would sit back and say, well, there are a bunch of lost people in this world. How do they know the word of God? Let me make you a promise. There may not be a, a ton of people in, around you or in your life that have accepted the Lord, but they know how a Christian should walk. They will look at you in a heartbeat. You may know somebody in your life that, that is lost as, as the day is long, but they can tell you what a Christian should not be doing uh, based on what is, what is right or wrong, even when they don't know the Word of God. Isn't that amazing? But it says this. It says, uh, uh, by this... By this it is evident who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Do you get that? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Folks, that's just plain and simple. That's black and white. You can go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, and you can read that to yourself. You can read it a thousand times, but it is not going to change. When it says, whoever does not practice righteousness is, is not of God. You know what he says? He said in the Word, he said that, that, that you, know, you, you call on him and you trust him, but he also has an expectation. <clears throat> and that expectation is that you and I as believers, as children of God, do the will of the Father. When you think about that earth, earthly relationship between fathers uh, and their children, whether they're sons or daughters, there is love. There is an expectation. Uh, you expect them uh, to uh, follow the standards that you are setting before them. And, and folks, remember this. The standards that you set before your children will be the standards that they will cling to, the standards that they will view as important enough uh, to, to, to have a life change or to walk in that regard. Are you teaching your children a biblical worldview? Are we loving our children in the manner in which the Father loved us? Are we teaching them the ways of righteousness? 
Folks, again, I beg you, do not miss out on teaching your children the greatest thing that, that, that could ever happen to them, and that is the love of God so much that he gave his only begotten son on Calvary's cross. And it's not simply about doing a bunch of do's and don'ts. God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to have a relationship with your children. Do not leave this earth without ensuring that your children have had the opportunity to trust in Christ. And then what does it talk about when it says, how should we walk after we have trusted him? He said, whoever does not practice righteousness, verse 10, latter part of it, is not of God. There's your evidence. There's your witness. The Lord tells us that when we walk with him, we will produce the fruits of the Spirit. And what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are those fruits in your life that people see that are evidence of God working in your life? Do they see a difference in you after you've accepted Christ than uh, the way you were before you accepted Him? Remember what we said, uh, the Lord in you changes you. You, know, you can't go on without that conviction. Maybe you're here tonight and you're listening to this message and you have just been completely miserable. Well, folks, let me tell you, you're miserable because the Holy Spirit is convicting your life. I've said many, many times in the past, and I will continue to say it, the most miserable person in the world is not the unbeliever because they don't know any better. The most miserable person in the world is the believer who is walking outside of the will of God because the conviction of the Holy Spirit is in their life. And folks, you cannot outrun the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Why don't you repent? Why don't you surrender? Why don't you allow God to forgive you and cover you with the shed blood of his only son and walk in righteousness that the world around you may see that your life might be full? Verse 11 says this, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Are we loving one another? Folks, I, I want to make you a promise that in this world today, we have got uh, some, some really interesting things going on uh, in our world. We, you know, we're having, it seems like our world is having trouble not even loving the, the, the lovable, uh, but not to mention the unlovable. But God told us this, we're supposed to even love our enemies. But you know what we need to do? We need to pray as we consider all these things, as the Holy Spirit has taught us. Let us pray today that each of us will continue to sin less and love more. You know, listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying in your life. Listen, if you don't have Jesus in your, in your heart, I'm begging you right now just to bow your head wherever you are and just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I hear you today. Come into my life and save my soul. Listen, if you did that, I promise you, he did. He's heard your prayer. You are turning your life over to him. When you did that, he gave you the Holy Spirit that is your teacher. I want to encourage you to get in the word of God. I encourage you that if, if you accepted Christ today, please contact us at, at, at our website, which is www.oakridgecbc.org. We would love to get you some uh, information and material to help you in your walk, to disciple you along the way. We promise we won't be overbearing. We're not going to bug you to death, but we would really like to help you in your walk as you follow the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer and you've been, I, I'm going to use the term systematic. It's been, well, let's just do all these things, but yet you've been missing out on what God has for you. Listen, listen to the Holy Spirit today. Repent, just like the prodigal son. Come to yourself today and return to the Father. Okay? In just a moment, I'm going to pray with you. I do want to give you uh, the readings for this week. Uh, this week, actually beginning today, uh, our Bible readings are uh, 2 John chapter 1 through Revelation chapter 2. Once again, that is 2 John chapter 1 through Revelation chapter 2. Now, that's five chapters, just like we've been asking you to read one chapter a day. Next week, uh, we're going to talk about leaving your first love uh, out of the book of Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And uh, man, I'll tell you one thing, uh, as we head into that uh, particular last book of the Bible, uh, man, what a, what a joy it is. And the Lord actually promises a blessing for those who will read and study the book of Revelation. Would you join us? Remember again, our readings, 2 John chapter 1 through Revelation chapter 2. I pray that each and every one of you will have a happy new year and that God will bless you and your family abundantly in the year 2021. May this be the best year ever, not only in our walk for the Lord, 
but with what God has uh, planned for us as we go into this new year. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you now. We're praising you and thanking you so much for uh, just who you are, uh, Lord, for uh, all that you do. Thank you, Father, for your love for us. That was uh, so much that you sent your only son to die on Calvary's cross that we might have eternal life. Lord, I pray that you will help us in our walk. Help us to walk in the ways of righteousness. And Lord, the only way we can do that is to be attached to you. Yet You are the vine. We are the branches. Help us, Father, to be attached to your word, to be attached to you in prayer, to walk with you, to listen to the Holy Spirit's guidance in our lives that we might walk in a fashion that is pleasing to you and in accordance with your word. So, Lord, we just pray that you will help us as we do that, give us leadership and guidance, and, and Lord, help us to walk closer to you in this new year of 2021 than we've ever walked before, that we might see you do great and incredible things, uh, that the righteousness that, that, that will come from us, uh, Lord, we pray that it will convince others that, uh, that to accept you, is truly what life is all about. Help us, Lord, as we bring up our children. Uh, help us to be proper influences in their presence. And Lord, we do ask this prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you Sunday.